권력은 부패하는 걸까요? 부패하기 쉬운 사람들이 권력에 이끌리는 걸까요? 왜 많은 이가 스트롱맨을 선택하는 거죠? 이 질문의 답을 찾기 위해 브라이언 클라스는 지난 10년간 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. <목소리> 전 세계에 흩어져 있는 위대한 생각들을 모았습니다. 어떤 생각은 우리를 저먼 곳으로 데려갑니다. 
Now, what Abraham Wald was asked to do by the United States government was to help them make good decisions in the war effort between the United States and Nazi Germany. And the problem that the US government presented Abraham Wald with was this. They said, we have all these airplanes that are going on bombing runs over Germany and are getting shot down. And we want your help, the mind of a statistician, to help us ensure that we're making the planes as robust and safe as possible so our pilots can come home. Now, what they did was they showed him a a, a, an airplane hangar full of airplanes riddled with bullet holes. Some of the airplanes that had been on bombing runs over Germany had holes in the wings, some of them had holes in the tail, and some of them had holes in the nose of the airplane. Now, all of the generals and all the sort of people who had looked at this problem previously had their own pet theory. They said, okay, we need to reinforce the wings or we need to reinforce the tail, or we need to reinforce the nose. Abraham Wald took one look at these airplanes and said, if you do any of those things, you're going to kill a ton of pilots. You're going to cause needless death. And the reason for that was because Abraham Wald understood the problem correctly through the lens of survivorship bias. What he understood was that the airplanes that really mattered the ones that you couldn't see were the airplanes that had already been shot down in Germany. The airplanes that had holes in the wings, the nose, and the tail were able to limp back from, from their bombing raids and end up landing at the air bases back in England, for example. And as a result, these were the planes that survived. They're the planes that were visible, the planes that you could still see. So Abraham Wald said, where you need to reinforce is where none of these planes have bullet holes, and that's in the engine. Because that, those holes kill the airplane. They actually knock it down over Germany and the, and the pilot tends to die. Now, what survivorship bias says is that you need to pay attention to the invisible airplanes in this analogy. And another way of understanding it is, is with something called the caveman effect. Now, we think about cavemen living in caves. Why do we think that they lived in caves? Because the artwork that they produced is on the walls of caves. Now, it's completely possible that cavemen lived outside of caves and painted and drew on trees, but those trees are long gone. We can't see them. So survivorship bias or the caveman effect says, look, all that we can see is what has survived. And that's created a skew in our perception. Now, the reason this matters for power is because the people in our societies who are powerful have, by definition, survived. And that is a really, really important dynamic to understand accurately, because when you think about power, you have three echelons of survivorship bias. The first echelon of survivorship bias is who seeks power in the first place. Who wants it, right? There are many people in society who have no interest whatsoever in getting power. The second level of survivorship bias is who gets power, who actually obtains the positions of leadership in our society. And what we see in our politicians, our business leaders, etc., are people who have survived through the first two levels, right? They have survived the first level because they've decided to seek power, and they've sur survived through the second level because they've actually gotten power. But there's a third level of survivorship bias with power that we have to think about, and that is maintaining power. The people who get power and hold on to it. There's a person who you've probably never heard of named Pedro Lascaran, and the reason you've never heard of him is because he's the shortest serving president in history who was the president of Mexico for 15 minutes. So he was able to survive his first level, seeking power, survive the second level, getting power. But he couldn't cut it on the third level. He couldn't maintain power. And as a result, he fell from power and did not maintain it. <laughs> 
Now, when you think of the politicians, the business leaders, the CEOs that you see in your own society who are at the top levels, those people have survived all three levels. They sought power, they got power, and they maintained power. Now, what that means is that we have a whole analysis of power that ignores a huge chunk of the problem. It ignores the people who never wanted power in the first place. So when you look at powerful people, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg in society. But below the surface, below that tip, there is a much larger chunk of humanity that might actually make great leaders, and they never get the opportunity. They haven't survived. Now this is important to understand because when we select for people in power, we are selecting through survivorship bias. And when we think about those who are power hungry, which is a phrase we use as an insult, we actually mean someone who seeks and gets power, which is by definition, the people that become powerful in our society. So when you think about powerful people, you have to think about it through this lens of survivorship bias. Now, the second way that you can think about society through the lens of a social scientist, through the eyes of someone who analyzes society, is by thinking that every single group of humans is a non-random subset of the population. Now, what I mean by that is that every single time that you put people together, there are skews in who shows up to that group. So if you think about a basketball tryout, for example, or a baseball tryout, what you're going to have in the baseball tryout, tryout is a series of people who are much more athletic on average than the rest of the population. With a basketball tryout, you're going to have people show up who are much taller on average than the rest of the population. So every single time that you put humans together in groups, there is a skew, what's called self-selection bias. Tall people self-select into basketball tryouts, more athletic people who are good at baseball self-select into baseball tryouts. The reason that matters for power is because power is the ultimate self-selection, right? It is a group of people who think to themselves, I should be in charge. Now that is a non-random set of the population, right? Most people do not think that. If you think about who's going to be the president of the United States, for example, most people in America do not think that they should be in charge. A very small subset of the population does. So whether you love me or hate me, you gotta vote for me. And they're a very strange subset, right? This is the other thing that's really, really important to understand, is that the group of people who self-selects into power is abnormal. They're weird. Not necessarily in a bad way, they're just unusual. And they're unusual with a series of traits that we're going to talk about in this series, like psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and a series of other traits about being power hungry that tend to manifest themselves in systems of power. So the question then becomes, who seeks power in the first place? And that's actually a very difficult question to answer. So we have to sort of tackle it in a few different ways. The first way to tackle it is to think about what can we learn from non-human species. And the reason you think about it this way is because human society has a whole bunch of biases, a whole bunch of systems that confound us when we try to study us, study ourselves. So we have to think about non-humans sometimes. And when you think about other animal species, we actually see that dominance or power-seeking behavior is sometimes hereditary. In other words, it is passed on through genes from father to son or mother to daughter and so on. In fact, if you look at animal species, you'll see that hyenas um, are actually dominant through the mother line, where the, the mother passes on dominance to her offspring. So if a mother is dominant in the pack of hyenas, the offspring will be dominant. The opposite is true for zebrafish, it's the father. If the father is dominant within zebrafish, the offspring will be dominant. So this gives us a hypothesis that leads us to believe perhaps the same is, hu is true of humans. Maybe we have a certain power-seeking trait that is passed on genetically. And indeed, there have been some studies that have suggested that this is true. Um, some researchers have found what they call a leadership gene. Now, 
anytime that you get a very simple, straightforward genetic uh, response or explanation for a very complex social dynamic, you should be skeptical because the world is not so simple. And actually, when you think about the leadership gene, it may be that it is tied to people who seek power, but more likely it's actually tied to traits that make you better at getting power. So people who are outgoing, extroverted, charming, likable, potentially even attractive, right? These traits can all be tied to power obtaining, not necessarily power seeking. So we can't necessarily disaggregate between which one is seeking and which one is good for obtaining. Now, all of this is to say that we don't really know. We don't have a clear answer to who seeks power. But we do know that there are good measures that we can use in psychology analysis to try to determine this. And there's a few different metrics that have been used through history, uh, modern history, to try to track this. One of them, for example, is called NPOW, or need for power. And psychologists try to measure this need for power in, in people, and they find that humanity exists on a spectrum. Some people score extremely high on this trait, some people not so much, they couldn't be bothered, they don't really care if they end up in charge, whereas other people are obsessed with power. They need it, they crave it, and they want dominance over others. There's another uh, trait that's sometimes measured called social dominance orientation, or SDO. Another way of measuring it, and this tends to be correlated with people who want to control other people. So, so social dominance orientation sometimes shows up very, very young in people who are bullies, for example. Um, they want to control others, they want to assert their power, and sometimes it shows up in quite destructive ways. Now, on top of this, you have to think about how systems attract certain people to power. And this is something that's very, very important to understand because as we'll see in this series, it's not just that power corrupts, it's that systems mediate who shows up for self-selection bias. Hollywood, 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. Welcome to EBS, Widihan Suap, Great Minds. My name is Brian Kloss. I'm an associate professor in global politics at University College London. So in my own work, when I've tried to think about who seeks power, what I decided to do is I decided to travel around the world and study people who are powerful. And that meant I went around everywhere from Madagascar to Thailand to Zambia and Belarus, the United States, everywhere you can think of to talk to powerful people, people who were business leaders, people who were sometimes corrupt, sometimes people who were former despots or dictators, and occasionally people who had done some really, really awful things, people who had ordered torture, who were involved in coup plots to overthrow governments, or had been in, in rebel armies and had killed people. 
And what was really interesting in this research was that I found that these people were extremely unusual, extremely different from the average person in society. And what I found really jarring in particular is that they were overwhelmingly charming. They were overwhelmingly likable. And this creates some sort of cognitive dissonance in your own head as a researcher, right? Because you know that you're sitting down with someone who has done some terrible, terrible things. And yet you're laughing along with their jokes. You're finding them charming or interesting. You like them, frankly. Now, I thought about this as I experienced it. Why are these people so incredibly likable? And the answer is because those are the people who get power. Right? The people in our societies who are most likely to end up in charge are the people who are most likely to make us like them. And the reason for that is because a series of uh, systems around power in our societies attract people who are particularly good at the sort of short periods of creating likability in other people's minds. If you think about a job interview, for example, it's about a 45 minute test of whether somebody can make you like them in that period of time. If you think about an election, it's the same sort of idea, right? You don't get to actually know the candidate, you just test whether you like them, enjoy their, their sort of persona, and think they'd end up in, uh, doing a good job when they end up in charge. Now, the reason this is so important is because if you take this and put it together with what I said before about survivorship bias, you'll understand that we are not matching what we actually want in power, which is good, decent people who will behave with integrity and lead our societies and our businesses uh, with exceptional talent and prowess and uh, kindness. Instead, what we are doing is we are trying to determine who can survive the three rungs of survivorship bias. And that means that we select for power in a very, very dysfunctional way. We choose who's in charge based on who's good at getting power. And who's good at getting power is not the same as who's good at wielding power. That's a very important to dis distinction to understand. Now, on top of this, we have all sorts of biases that exist in our societies. So, for example, in many societies, we have problems with misogyny and uh, sexism and racism. And this is truly important because the ways that our distribution of power performs when it comes to who ends up in charge are mediated through social biases where we have been conditioned to think about people in power as looking a certain way. Right? Now, when you think about this and how it actually manifests itself in the real world, there's an amazing study that was done a few years ago where they gave children uh, pictures of faces. And they said to these children, we want you to look at these faces and we want you to decide between the two options who looks like the person who should be in charge of your imaginary ship. But the only information the children was, were given was faces, right? Just two pictures side by side. Now, the kids did not know that the faces that they were given, one of them was the winner of a recent election in Europe, and the other one was the runner-up in that election, right? So the person who won the election and the person who came in second. And yet, despite not having any information to go on, systematically, the kids picked the winner as the person to champion their ship, to captain their ship. In other words, they were able to discern from faces alone who looked like a leader, and that matched up very, very closely with who voters actually chose to be their leader. Now, this is important to understand because we often like to think of power as being allocated for rational reasons, right? We give power to people who are competent, good, decent, wise, etc. In fact, what this study is showing us is that very often we're making extremely superficial judgments about who looks like a leader to us. Now, that's particularly problematic in modern society where we have all these biases of things like racism and sexism because throughout modern history, the people who have looked powerful are overwhelmingly in Western societies, for example, white men. So when the studies have been done in Western societies, what they've found is that the correlation between those who look powerful and demographic biases of those who were powerful in the past is very, very strongly overlapping. Now this tells us that we need to think carefully about how to represent people in power to attract those who are systematically out of power in modern life. And what I mean by that is if you think about yourself as someone who might want to seek and obtain power in the future, 
You might look up in society and you might see people who look quite unlike you, right? A, a lot of modern societies, for example, are dominated by men in power. So if you're a, a, a woman, a young woman who's thinking, I want to become powerful, and you look up in society and you see a series of men, that creates a systematic bias, sometimes uh, subconsciously even, which causes some people to think, I don't belong in this group, right? It's a really sad statement on our, our, our modern societies that it's like this, but it does have a systematic effect. And on top of that, when it comes to allocating power, people subconsciously, sometimes consciously, also operate on these biases. So if you put these things together, we have social dynamics that systematically bias certain types of people into getting power. But even before that, we have these biases within us, sometimes personality traits, sometimes power-hungry characteristics, the need for power, social dominance orientation, that cause some people to seek power more in the first place. And as a result of that, we have this culling process, right? And so what I think about is that all of us look at power and we make a major mistake. We look at powerful people and we say, wow, they're all awful. Why do we end up with these people in charge? And then we condemn the individual and we replace them with somebody else and we end up repeating history. We end up with another person in charge who is corrupt or abuses their power or makes mistakes in leadership. And we wonder why this cycle persists. Why do we keep on getting the same bad leaders? And the answer I suggest is because our systems are broken. And our systems are broken because our mechanisms of power attract the wrong people, promote them into positions of power based on whether they're good at getting power rather than whether they're good at wielding power, and then allows them to stay in power much longer than they should. So if we're going to fix this problem, if we're going to reform power and make it better for us, if we're going to be the first generation in history to solve the problem that perplexed and baffled humans since the Roman and ancient Greeks and Egyptian times, well, then we have to think smarter. And to do that, we have to fundamentally reform how power operates so it attracts and promotes and maintains people who are the best among us rather than too often the worst. But I think we can actually fix this problem. But before I want to start with a story, a tale of two stories actually, of island shipwrecks and island uh, strandings. Now, in the 1600s, there was a ship called the Batavia, which was part of the Dutch East India Company. And it shipwrecked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Australia. Now, the survivors ended up on this little spit of land that was completely inhospitable. So the leaders of the company decided to set off in some spare boats to try to find help so they could get food and water and so on and, and, and recover everybody. And that meant that there was a, a group of people left on the island alone. And among those people was somebody who was a very power-hungry psychopath who decided to assert power for himself. And to do so, he began killing people. And in the end, the survivors of the Batavia were systematically murdered by this man as he sought to control everybody else. Now this gives you a very bleak idea of what the sort of state of nature is when it comes to human behavior. When the rules go away and you're stu stuck on a desert island, maybe we all just end up taking advantage of each other, destroying the sort of constraints of human society, and becoming predators. Now, that's a very dystopian, depressing view of humanity. But in this instance, these boys were stranded on an island called Atta. Instead of this being dominated by uh, sort of competition, combativeness, violence, and abuse, the boys worked together. They cooperated to solve problems. They rotated, they shared. When one of the boys got injured, rather than being abused or attacked, they simply took care of him. It was an instance in which the rules of society were taken away, and instead of the sort of dystopian, despicable behavior that happened with the Batavia shipwreck, this was an image of humanity that was much more positive. <laughs> 
where power was used and shared to solve collective problems. So the question is, what are we truly like as a species? Are we more like the Batavia, or are we more like those boys on Atta, who solved problems by working together? Now, to answer that question, we have to think about how we evolved. Because evolutionary theory, which is a very well-validated scientific theory, tells us that we have come out of other species over time, right? If you go very, very far back into the mists of geological time and history, If you come a little bit further close to us in history, to about six million years ago, you'll find something called the chimpanzee human last common ancestor. This is where humans diverged from apes, where we diverged from chimpanzees, our closest primate relatives. And at that point, we were all sort of the same, right? But over the six million years of evolution, humans, modern humans have developed, they've emerged out of this evolutionary process, and modern humans, Homo sapiens, have about 200,000 years of history on the planet. Now, the reason this matters for power is very straightforward. If you look at chimpanzee politics, which is a, a term by a, a biologist named Franz de Waal, who has explored this in depth, you will see that chimpanzees actually have very, very strict hierarchies, and those hierarchies are completely orchestrated around dominance in which a clear chimpanzee winner is at the top. But there is also a little bit of cooperation. There's sort of a little bit of jockeying for power. There are chimpanzee coup d'etats where the sort of one chimp will overthrow another chimp and so on. So there's this sort of hypothesis that can germinate from observing chimpanzees that if we all have this sort of common ancestor from six million years ago, maybe our politics, maybe our power is basically the same. Right? We derive from the same source. Why not look to chimps to understand ourselves? And yet there's a wrinkle in this narrative, which is that when you actually look at human behavior, it doesn't mirror chimps. And actually it doesn't mirror chimps very, very early on in our childhoods. So uh, a psychologist named Michael Tomasello has examined human behavior among young children. And he effectively set up an experiment where children would be given a situation where they would get rewards, and sometimes those rewards would be unequal for completely arbitrary reasons. So one kid would basically get more candy than another kid. And what they found was that two years old, this did not bother the children in the least, right? The children who got more just happily munched down on their candy, took the advantage they had, and had no qualms about injustice. But once they got to three years old, something changed. And all of a sudden, the kids started to worry about fairness. They started to think about what it would be like to be the kid who got less candy. And as a result of this, they start to share voluntarily. The kid who gets more ends up giving a little bit extra to the kid who got less. So very early on, by the time that we're three years old, we diverge from our chimpanzee ancestors. We operate differently. We have norms about fairness and we have views about injustice that we worry about, right? We actually think we want to live in a just society. Brian 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. 
전 세계에 흩어져 있는 위대한 생각들을 모았습니다. 어떤 생각은 우리를 저먼 곳으로 데려갑니다. 안녕하세요. They're sometimes called tribes, but the more formal name is bands. And bands of humans tend to live in very small groups, often as small as something like 60 to 80 people. Now, when you live in a group of 60 to 80 people, your experience of society is fundamentally different from how it operates today, right? We live in nation states of tens of millions of people. We're part of a globalized society of 8 billion other humans. Our world is vastly more complex. And yet, as we navigate that world, We're doing so with minds that have been chiseled by evolution, trained by evolution, to navigate a world that is totally unlike the one that we now inhabit. A world of much more simple causes and effects, a world of much more simple societies, a world of small groups of people working together to solve problems. And what anthropologists have discovered when they have looked at those humans who still live in BAM, Remember, there are still people who are hunter-gatherers in modern life. They're often completely outside of modern society, but they still exist. Those people live a very different life from us. They live mostly in flat societies. And when I say flat societies, I mean societies that have very little hierarchy. So if you think about our societies today, Pretty much everything in life is mediated through hierarchy, right? When you go to school, you might have an advisor, you have a professor, you have a teacher. When you end up in the working world, you often have a boss, your boss has a boss, they have a boss. And above that, you have government, which has a very strict hierarchy of you know, governors and presidents and prime ministers and so on. We map our lives according to these vertical charts of hierarchy. That's how everything gets done, right? But hunter-gatherers, both in the very distant past and those who still live like hunter-gatherers today, these sort of uncontacted tribes in places like Papua New Guinea or Brazil, for example, they live in much more flat societies. They don't have people in charge. Now, why is that? Well, one of the reasons for this is that in a small group of people, it can become very toxic very quickly to have one person in charge. And when you don't have the sort of millions of people to orchestrate behavior between, to, to, to make people do things according to rules and so on, 60 to 80 people is actually a manageable amount who can work together. So they do. And they have discovered something called a reverse dominance hierarchy, which sounds very complicated, but it's actually very straightforward. What it means is that the societies of hunter-gatherers evolved and developed rules in which they would have flat societies. And anytime somebody tried to seize power or assert dominance over others, they would be torn down to size, right? They would sort of be taken down. And they even came up with some really interesting ways of doing this. So uh, the Kung tribe in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, What they did was they developed a system of rotating arrowheads so that everybody would get credit for hunting. What I mean by this is that you can imagine that one particularly good hunter might emerge as a potential leader. And so that person would take credit for providing food for the group, and they would ultimately end up uh, 
having a greater claim to being in charge of the society. So what they decided to do is they said, look, we're not going to give credit for hunting based on who kills the animal. We're going to give it based on who owns the arrowhead that was used to kill the animal. And those arrowheads are going to be randomly rotated throughout society. And as a result, everybody gets an equal share of the credit for hunting. Now, this sounds a bit abstract, but it effectively means that they came up with very formal rules and mechanisms to obliterate hierarchy, to make sure that society stayed flat. So the question is, why does that not persist to the present day? Why don't we have flat societies? Well, let's go back to the chimpanzees for a moment. The chimpanzees are able to assert dominance over each other very, very easily because the way you become powerful in a chimpanzee society is by being stronger and bigger than the other chimps. They basically have battles, they have fights, right? And they have sort of fights where somebody will, you know, one chimp will challenge another. The winner is powerful. Why don't we do that, right? Why, I mean, obviously this is a terrible idea, but why, why is it not the case that humans just use gladiatorial style combat to determine who's in charge? And the answer is sort of interesting. It's actually derived from the fact that we invented what are called ranged weapons. Ranged weapons are things like spears, bows and arrows, rocks, etc. I have a, a section in, in my book, Corruptible, where I have the sort of headline, the reason why we have uh, different power structures than chimps is because chimps can't play baseball. And what I mean by that is chimpanzees are completely unable to throw objects accurately. They have shoulders that are totally different from ours. And as a result, if they tried to throw a rock, it would basically go sideways. Humans can throw over 100 miles an hour. And so what this means in our practical application is that all of a sudden, a very weak human, somebody who's small, not particularly strong, can kill a very strong human. That's what ranged weapons do. They're the great equalizer, right? We have these, of course, unfortunately, in, in modern society with things like guns. Doesn't matter who's uh, tall or strong or physically fit with a gun. It's the great equalizer because it is a ranged weapon. In practice, this has meant that you can enforce a lack of hierarchy because the stronger chimp or human has now got to reckon with ranged weapons. And so the theory that anthropologists have come up with is that the onset of ranged weapons correlates very, very well with the change from Homo sapiens being dominated by physically strong members of the group to having a much more equal society. Now, of course, there are outliers in history. Occasionally, there are societies that have more power uh, in, in single individuals than others. But for the most part, societies in the past were much flatter than they are today. This changed about 11,000 years ago. And the reason for that has basically two dueling hypotheses. One of them is the agriculture hypothesis, and one of them is the conquest hypothesis. What this means in practice for the agricultural argument is that all of a sudden, about 11,000 years ago, humans realized how to cultivate crops in a way that was much more reliable. So rather than having to hunt and gather food for survival, we decided to set up shop in one place to hunt, to, to sort of plant crops and to grow things. And as a result, all of a sudden, it became possible to have larger cities, right? Because when you had to get your food on a day-to-day -day basis, roaming around the countryside, killing animals or gathering berries, you couldn't sustain thousands of people in one place. In fact, you would starve if you did that. With agriculture, you suddenly could. So the agriculture hypothesis says, with the onset of farming and the spread of farming through human societies, the groups of people got much bigger. The bands of 60 to 80 people became cities of thousands and tens of thousands of people and so on. And that meant that eventually you had to have hierarchy because coordinating between 60 to 80 people is a very different job than coordinating tens of thousands of people and getting them to behave in decent ways. Now, the conquest hypothesis is rather different. This is the idea that in warfare, eventually, one group would conquer another. And when they conquered another group, they would grow the size of their community. 
enemies. So let's imagine you've got 500 soldiers in one group fighting 500 soldiers in another. Group A beats group B, and now you have 1,000 soldiers. And that group realizes that 1,000 soldiers is going to win more battles. So there becomes a pressure the more that humans engage in warfare to get bigger and bigger armies. And the conquest or warfare hypothesis says that as this pressure spread, the size of human groups expanded, and again, hierarchy took root. Now, there are some other species of animals and insects and so on that are able to coordinate without hierarchy. Um, so some social insects, uh, they have one queen, for example, and then they have a group of coordinated uh, sort of drones or workers, and that's made possible because of communication and rule-making structures that are done with scents and pheromones and all these sorts of things. Humans don't have this, right? We are not bees or wasps or ants. So we need to come up with different ways to coordinate, and that way that we've decided is power. We use power to uh, allocate tasks and divide uh, responsibility among human society. However, this is something that's very important to understand. Because we've evolved for a world that no longer exists, because our minds have been forged in the distant past where hunter-gatherers had to solve problems in a world completely unlike the one that we live in, there is now something called evolutionary mismatch with power. Now, evolutionary mismatch also applies to power, and it applies to power in a particularly destructive way around what's called strongman leaders. If you think about trying to determine who would be in charge of your society 10,000 years ago, or even if you were a hunter-gatherer society and you were raided by a rival band or tribe, at that moment, you might actually turn to a leader, right? You need a warrior to, to lead you into battle. And in that moment, you would pick, surprise, surprise, a physically large man because very, very likely 100,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, your best chance of survival was to fall behind a physically large man. Suddenly we become much more like the chimpanzees. Now, in modern society, evolutionary mismatch has meant that our brains are conditioned to think like this still because our brains for 99.8% of the evolution of our species were able to survive better when we did think like this, evolutionary mismatch. What does this mean in practice? Well, it means in practice that when you conduct experiments and studies of leadership selection where people have to choose who's in charge of their society, and you then prime them by telling them, look, we're in a situation where there's an impending war or a famine or a crisis or some sort of pandemic. Well, in those instances, then systematically people become more likely to pick physically strong men to be their leaders in these experiments. It's completely bonkers. It doesn't make any sense. It's not actually adaptive anymore. But it still happens, right? The experiments show this over and over and over. Now, some leaders have figured this out, and they capitalize on it. So if you've ever seen photos of Vladimir Putin, the leader of Russia, shirtless, there's a reason he's doing this. He is tapping into this mentality, this evolved sense that we should turn to physically strong men during times of crisis. And indeed, there are many political scientists who will tell you that when Putin faces a moment of unpopularity, that is precisely when he starts talking about crises, because it activates this sort of latent template in our brains, which causes us to think we need to turn to a physically strong man, which is where the term strong man comes from, which means an authoritarian leader who says, you know, I alone can fix it, basically. And as a result of this, we have some very silly cognitive biases that continue to pervert the way that we choose leaders. Now, what I often say is, imagine that you had any other realm other than power where this was used. So let's imagine you go to the dentist, and the dentist tries to show you how strong they are and how good of a dentist they are by ripping off their shirt and doing some push-ups on the ground, right? You would think this was absolutely ridiculous. You would almost certainly report them to the board, but you would also want to get a different dentist. At the same time, with power, we have this all the time, right? We have people who are politically powerful who try to show themselves as physically strong men. And this compounds some of the other social biases that exist in our societies around things like misogyny and sexism and causes us to select people for the wrong reasons. Now, there's sort of two ways to resolve this problem. One is to just pretend it doesn't exist, to bury our heads in the sand and say, no, there's nothing to do with evolution when it comes to power selection or leadership selection. 
The other, the version that I favor, is that given that we have evidence that this exists, that these biases, these stupid uh, sort of shortcuts that our minds have evolved to make do exist, and we can see them operating in experiments and in the real world, we need to acknowledge it and design systems to counteract them. I think the first step for overcoming strongman bias, for example, is acknowledging it exists and then being attuned to it so that when somebody tries to tap into this irrational side of our brains, we're ready with a defense to think, wait a minute, should I vote for someone who is a strong man because they look like a strong man, or should we actually evaluate power in a much more rational and reasonable way based on their talents, their abilities, their kindness, and their compassion? And that's why understanding the evolution of power is so important, because it allows us to understand where these biases came from, and that, in my view, is the first step in correcting them and making power work better for all of us. Hollywood, 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. Welcome to EBS, Widihan Suap, Great Minds. My name is Brian Kloss. I'm an associate professor in global politics at University College London. Whenever we think about power, we tend to focus on powerful people, the people who are in charge of our societies, the politicians, the CEOs, and those who are leaders. But we're missing a serious part of the story when it comes to power, and that is the system. And as I'll try to convince you here, the system, I think, is much more important because the system determines not just who ends up in power, but how power operates in our societies. And if we want to make power work better, we have to fix the system. But first, I have to convince you that systems matter. Now, there's been a lot of research that's done that's shown this. And one of the studies that I love is looking at the differences in culture between those who grow up in rice-growing societies and those who grow up in wheat-growing societies. So those who have bread as part of their, the main part of their diet versus those who have rice as the main part of their diet. And the hypothesis that some scientists came up with was that rice is a communal crop. Rice is a crop that you really have to work together to cultivate. And that if your rice field floods, it will damage other people's rice. Now, wheat is much more individualistic, right? You can plant it in your own field, you don't really need to worry about everybody else, and therefore, it's up to you. And what they've found is that this does actually dovetail pretty well with distributions of human culture between more individualistic and more collective uh, cultures in, 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 in human society. And in fact, in China, they actually found some areas where there's variation within China. <laughs> 
What they found is that those areas of China that are more dominant with wheat production are much more individualistic than those that grow rice. So what this tells you is that everything about our systems affects us, even when we're completely unaware of it. And when it comes to power, it's that effect on overdrive, right? Power is absolutely swayed by the way the system is designed and how it operates. So systems matter when it comes to power. And I found this out firsthand when I did my research around the world, speaking to about 500 powerful people. And one of them, I think, shows you this very, very clearly. Uh, a man at the extremes of power, a man named Paul Bremer. Now, Paul Bremer was the person who George W. Bush, the former president of the United States. So what Paul Bremer did in his previous career was he was a diplomat, an ambassador. He went around the world representing the United States government in places as diverse as Malawi and Norway. And in those roles, he behaved very, very well. He was completely uh, a person of integrity. He acted always above board, always in a way that was honest and decent, exactly what you'd want in a position of power. And then all of a sudden, in 2003, he gets a phone call from the American Secretary of Defense, and he says to, to Paul Bremer, I want you to run Iraq. I want you to be in charge of this country that we've just invaded. And so Paul Bremer, almost overnight, inherited a dictatorship, a system that was totally unlike anything that he had dealt with before, right? He'd previously been just the US ambassador to a place like Norway, where there's many rules, the systems of power work very well, and so on. So the question is, what happens when someone with a good track record, who's behaved well, who's behaved with honesty and decency, is thrust into a bad system? And in 2003, Iraq was a bad system. Not only was it a dictatorship where brutality was rewarded in the government, but also the country was falling apart as a result of the US invasion. All the systems of power had broken down, there was chaos and anarchy in the streets, and people were beginning to use violence. Now, very early on, Paul Bremer held a staff meeting, and he decided to discuss things with his team in Iraq about what to do about all the people who were looting shops, in other words, who were stealing goods from stores, right? And doing so in a very violent way. And the worry at the time was that this would cause the breakdown of order and would lead to a widespread civil war, which ultimately did happen. And Paul Bremer turned to his aides and he said, do you think we should use force against people who are stealing things? Should we shoot the looters? Now, that is not a conversation that Paul Bremer ever in a million years would have had in Norway. But in Iraq, where everything was totally different, where the system was brutal and he was worried about a civil war, all of a sudden he began to think differently. And what this story tells you is that the systems of power change the behavior of the people. Now, I got the sense of this firsthand because I met Paul Bremer, believe it or not, in Vermont where I took a ski lesson with him because he's retired now. He's a ski instructor who skis in Vermont. And I said, I wanna to speak to him. He said, sure, come along. We'll go and ski together. You can talk to me there. And what was really amazing is that he's, he's a very nice man, right? He, he's somebody who you'd never imagine when he's teaching children how to ski that he could have several years ago contemplated the idea of killing people for stealing TVs from stores. And yet he did, right? So this was a classic example, in my view, of how the person transported into a different system behaves differently. Now this, of course, makes a lot of sense if you think about the people who end up in charge of, dict of dictatorships as well, right? The skills that you need to become a dictator somewhere like North Korea are very, very different from the, the skills that you would need to become the prime minister or president in a very well-regulated, democratic, rich country. So the system matters. And this is the most important, I think, takeaway when you think about power, is that if you only focus on the people, you are ignoring half of the problem. Now, another realm where this lesson becomes very, very clear is in the realm of policing, right? When you think about police, there's a lot of places where police abuse is a major, major concern. 
where violence is used against innocent civilians, where police are corrupt, or where occasionally they even will kill people. And one of the people that the police have killed is a man named George Floyd, who was killed in 2020 by the police in my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is where I'm from. And the police, unfortunately, you know, kneeled on George Floyd's neck for, for eight minutes until he was dead. And this is part of a pattern of police abuse that exists in the United States where many, many people are, are killed each year in police violence uh, in an abuse of power. So the question is, why is that? Now, it's very easy to simply say, because you have bad apples. In other words, because you have crooked cops in the uniform who are overly violent and behave badly. And that is part of the explanation. But there's a deeper question, which is why do they end up in the uniform in the first place? Why do we end up with cops who are violent in the United States more than other places? So the question I started to grapple with was what explains this? And the answer lies with something called police recruitment, which is how do you end up recruiting police to become officers in the first place? Now, in the United States, if you look at police advertising, in other words, the sort of, uh, you know, advertising that's aimed at people who want to become police officers, it's very, very unusual. There are a series of, of ads that I looked at in uh, police communities around the United States, which are just absolutely broken. And one of them that stood out to me is a place called Doraville, Georgia, which is a small community of about 10,000 people just outside of Atlanta in the southeastern United States. And the Doraville, Georgia advertisement to try to attract police officers a few years ago was absolutely insane. What it showed when you started the video was the logo of the Punisher, which is a comic book vigilante anti-hero who captures and then tortures criminals, right? So the first thing that you have on screen when you're trying to recruit police officers is the image of somebody who tortures criminals. Then what you see next is you see a series of police officers from Doraville riding into view on a SWAT team tank, a literal tank, a military combat vehicle. And it says SWAT on the side, and they sort of drive very aggressively in this tank. They get out, they toss some smoke grenades, uh, in, and they're in camouflage combat gear. They look like an, uh, soldiers in an army rather than police officers in a community. and they begin to shoot their assault rifles at targets. And the whole thing is set to the song of death metal music, right? Uh, with a song that I cannot repeat the title of in this video because it's full of profanity. So you think about this and you think, who looks at this video and says, yes, sign me up, I want to be a police officer in Doraville. I mean, the answer is obviously non-random. There's a certain kind of person who looks at that, the Punisher logo, the violence, the combat uh, outfits, the tank, and says, yeah, I'd like to drive around my town of 10,000 people in a tank. It's a non-random subset of the population, and those people are systematically more likely to be militaristic, abusive, authoritarian individuals who view policing as a way to play with guns and to assert their dominance over other people. So that's what you get. Right? And indeed, the United States has a disproportionate number of combat veterans in police uh, departments around the country and a disproportionate amount of violence. Now, one country realized that this was a problem and decided to take action to combat it. And that country is New Zealand. New Zealand thought very, very carefully about how to design a system around policing to attract people who do not want to use police uh, mechanisms and, and sort of uh, power to abuse or use violence against individuals, but rather to serve their community as public servants. So what did they do? Well, they enlisted a PR campaign, basically a sort of advertising and marketing campaign, to try to attract a different kind of officer into the force. Now, if you look up the New Zealand police recruitment ads, and they're on YouTube, they have millions of views, they're very well done and very funny. They start with a person in the uniform who is uh, chasing an unseen criminal. We don't really know who the criminal is, but we can see that they're all sort of chasing after them. 
Now, the people who are chasing them do not necessarily look like your standard depiction of a police officer. There's a large number of women who are in the uniform. There's a large number of ethnic minorities. And there are people who are stopping during the chase to help elderly people cross the road. There's a few sort of you know, comical gags where they stop and dance with people. It's sort of a view of policing that's very fun and community oriented. And then finally, when they get to the end, they finally catch up with this criminal they've been chasing. And the criminal turns out to be a border collie, a dog, who has stolen a woman's purse. And on screen, it shows the words, do you care enough to be a cop, okay? This is the exact opposite of the Punisher logo and the door of a lad. Rather than saying we're going to depict policing as a militarized occupation in an army, this is depicting a, a sort of view of policing where people who care about others in their society should put on the uniform. And what happened in New Zealand? Well, what happened was the number of applicants to become police officers shot through the roof. They had a massive surge in applicants. They also had a major surge in different kinds of applicants. So they had a larger number of women apply. They had a larger number of ethnic minorities apply. And they also had different demographic and personality traits end up applying to be police officers. People who are less authoritarian in their personalities, less prone to violence. And lo and behold, over time, the police officers in New Zealand developed better relations with their communities and they used violence less. Now what this tells you is that the system that attracts people into power is a crucial variable in how power operates in our societies. And if we just end up condemning individuals over and over and over without thinking about the system, we will end up replicating exactly the same problems. If the system is known for being extremely squeaky clean and above board, then people who are honest and decent will gravitate towards that system. So this tells you that to solve the problems of power, you have to fix the system. Hollywood, 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. Welcome to EBS, Widihan Suap, Great Minds. My name is Brian Kloss. I'm an associate professor in global politics at University College London. And the United Nations in New York City uh, has diplomatic immunity, is what it's called, for those who represent their country in the United Nations. So if you are an official diplomat working in the UN in New York City and you commit a crime, officially you cannot be prosecuted for that crime. And this even applies to illegally parking. 
Now, the reason this matters is because over time, diplomats started to take advantage of the system. It was worth about $18 million in total that the city of New York was not getting in parking fines from these diplomats. So finally, about 20 years ago, the mayor of New York City at the time, a man named Michael Bloomberg, decided to do something about this. And what he did was he changed the rules where he said, look, we can't prosecute you, you have diplomatic immunity. But diplomatic immunity does not protect your car. So we can take away your car, we can tow it away and impound it if you park illegally. Now, the reason this is important is it's because it looks like what social scientists call a natural experiment. In the first time period, you have diplomats who can get away with anything, the Wild West, right? There's no rules. In the second time period, after this legal change has happened, there are consequences for abusing your power. All of a sudden, you lose your car if you park illegally. So what happened? What was really, really amazing here was that in time period one, when there's no rules, then the abuse of power is totally correlated to cultures of corruption. In other words, the people who represented countries where corruption was rampant, places like Egypt and Yemen and Chad in Sub-Saharan Africa, many of those countries, they had on average about 190 parking tickets per diplomat, right? It was like an absolutely crazy situation where each diplomat had hundreds of parking tickets that they were not paying. On the other end of the spectrum, you had countries that were less corrupt, Norway, Japan, etc., where there were low levels of uh, illegal parking. Their, their diplomats had one or two or zero uh, parking fines per diplomat. So all of a sudden at the beginning, when there's no rules, uh, no consequences, you have a sort of bifurcation, a divide by corruption in the culture. Then, when you have the enforcement, where all of a sudden consequences are imposed, everything changes overnight. And the way it changes is that all of a sudden, the diplomats who are from places like Egypt and Yemen that used to be parking illegally, immediately converge and start behaving like those who are from Norway and Japan. In other words, the enforcement, the accountability, changes the abuse of power completely. So when the rules are very lax and people can get away with stuff, they tend to be divided by cultures. Then the system is very, very important. But then, if the system changes its rules and imposes penalties on abuse of power, you can get uniform good behavior just by imposing account accountability on people who are already abusing their power. But interestingly, and I, I love this little bit of the study, this little last wrinkle, if you had the people who are from Japan and Norway living in a system where they could get away with it for a very long time, so in other words, if they were in New York City for a long time before the accountability and the legal change was imposed, they started to park illegally more. So the people who are from these cultures that did not have corruption started to think, I can get away with this. I can actually behave illegally because there's no consequences. So that teaches you a really important lesson about human society. It's one of the most important lessons about power. So now we get to the very big question, does power corrupt? Long ago, a man named Lord Acton said it did. He had a quote that said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is sort of the folk wisdom around power. It's what most people think when they think of power and how it changes people. But the big question is, is that actually true? Now, the best evidence for this for a long time has been through something called the Stanford Prison Experiment, which is one of the most famous uh, experiments in the history of psychology. The Stanford Prison Experiment was very simple. A man named Philip Zimbardo, who was a professor at Stanford in the 1970s, decided to convert the psychology building, the basement of the psychology building at Stanford University, into a fake jail. And the way he set it up was he had an advertisement that was sent out And they tried to recruit student volunteers and other volunteers to become fake prisoners and fake prison guards. So they were sort of randomly allocated to either be a prisoner or a prison guard in the experiment. And they weren't really given that many other rules or sort of instructions. And they just sort of saw what happened. Now, what happened was terrifying because within a matter of days, the prison guards were abusing the prisoners. 
They were abusing them in terrible ways, so much so that Zimbardo's girlfriend, who came to visit the experiment, told him he had to shut it down. That's how out of hand it had gotten. And these were people who, before the experiment, were peers. Some of them might have even been friends, but they were certainly all at the same sort of social level. Now, the evidence that seems to be derived from the Stanford prison experiment is that power corrupts us. That if you put the right uniform on, if you turn someone who's an ordinary person into a prison guard, they will become abusive. But here's the thing, I think that that study has been completely misinterpreted, that we've misunderstood it, and that's because of some information that wasn't made clear at the time of the study. Now, how did the people end up in this experiment? In 2007, some researchers decided to try to replicate the Stanford Prison Experiment, but with one key tweak. They took the exact same wording from the original advertisement. And the original advertisement said, we're looking for people to participate in a study, a psychological study of prison life. And then they also tried to replicate the same exact wording and just take out the words of prison life. And then they decided to see who would show up for the various ads. And then they waited for people to show up. And when they showed up, they tested them psychologically. They did uh, evaluations of their personality and their traits. And what they found was astonishing. The people who had responded to the psychological study of prison life, where they knew they were going to be in a prison-like environment, were systematically more Machiavellian, abusive, narcissistic, authoritarian personalities than those who responded to the generic advertisement. Now this completely flips the Stanford Prison Experiment finding on its head. Because for decades what we've believed is that this study has shown us that power corrupts. And in fact what it shows, as we've talked about in previous episodes, is that power attracts the corruptible. That the system matters and the way you recruit matters. Now this doesn't mean that power does not corrupt. It does. There is clear evidence that power actually changes people. And I'll get into some of that detail in a little bit. But before that, I want to tell you a story from my own research of a woman I interviewed who I think is the sort of poster child of the idea that power corrupts, that it changes people. Ma'an Anshila was an Indian woman, grew up and looked for a little bit more meaning in her life when she was 18 years old. So she joined a sort of new age cult called the Rajneeshis. And this was with a man at the helm named Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who was a guru, right? A sort of deity on earth, as it were, to his followers. Now, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh was kicked out of India for, for tax problems, and so they wanted to set up shop somewhere else, and they decided to set up shop in Western Oregon, in the United States. Now, Sheila was tasked with setting up this new town, and they set up shop in a place called Antelope, Oregon, a, a small city of about 50 people. Now, what happened next was that Sheila ended up becoming extremely powerful in a very short period of time. She developed this town from a town of 50 people into a town of thousands, all of them disciples of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And she also developed an international airport, thousands of homes, uh, you know, modern plumbing and all sorts of electric, uh, you know, electricity and supplies and so on. And when she was in charge of this group, she was almost like God on earth because Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh took a vow of silence at one point and she became his voice. So you take this person who at the age of 18 is effectively an art student back in India and you fast forward just the span of a couple years and she ends up being the voice of a God to her disciples uh, in Oregon, in the Western United States. What happened? Well, she became powerful and the power corrupted her. And the way it corrupted her was she started to think that the ends justified the means. So at one point, local government officials said, you know, I think we're going to shut down this commune because we can't have these thousands of people from all over the world coming into this small, sleepy town of 50 people in, in Oregon. So they said, we're going to shut you down. Well, she said, hold on, we have enough Americans in our group that we can just take over the town through an election. 
So they end up running candidates to take over the town and they succeed. And they change the name from Antelope Oregon to Rajneesh Param after the Rajneeshi group. So now they've taken control of the town, but the county level is now trying to shut them down. And they just don't have enough people in the group to win an election at the county level. So what does Sheila think? Well, she thinks, I can't win by just running candidates and having enough people vote for them. Maybe I can win if I depress the number of voters, if I reduce the number of people casting ballots in the broader community. And the way she decides to do this is by poisoning people. And so what Sheila does is she orchestrates the worst bioterror attack in American history, poisoning about a thousand people with salmonella sprinkled onto salad bars around restaurants in the area. with the idea that this would end up depressing voter turnout so that they could then win the election and take control of the county. At the same time, there's investigators coming from the federal government, the United States government, and she poisons three of them with water. The, she puts uh, this sort of poison, this toxic in their water and serves it to them, and they get extremely ill. Thankfully, none of them died, but people were hospitalized as a result of these attacks. So she served several years in jail. She was uh, in prison for about four or five years in the United States for being the worst bioterrorist in American history. And then she was deported and she set up her life in Switzerland. And as far as we can tell, has not done anything wrong since. Now, I went and I interviewed Ma Sheila a couple years ago in Switzerland. And believe it or not, she is in charge of a care home for people who have mental illness. She has behaved with integrity. She has helped people. And she's even done so well that the Swiss government has allowed her to be in charge of vulnerable people. And when I met her, she was incredibly kind. Now, I will say she offered me a glass of water, which I declined. But beyond that, everything was flawless, right? And this is the sort of standard textbook case of power corrupting. She ends up in this situation where she has immense power. She thinks that the ends justifies the means. She starts to do things that she never would have done before. And she becomes a monster, quite frankly. I mean, she nearly killed many, many people. But as we saw before, there's also the Stanford prison experiment to grapple with, which seemed to attract corruptible people to the advertisement that was for prison life. So we have sort of two hypotheses that both seem to be true. On the, on the one hand, you have power corrupting, and on the other hand, you have power attracting corruptible people. And the answer is, it's both. Both of them are valid explanations for what power uh, does to people, and also how the dynamics of power tend to attract people who might not be the best at wielding it. Brian 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. Brian Class, 
Welcome to EBS, Wiedihan Suop, Great Minds. My name is Brian Kloss. I'm an associate professor in global politics at University College London. What does power actually do to a person? And there's a lot of evidence that it changes someone, and it changes them in two ways. The first way is that it changes their mind, it changes how they think. And the second way is that it actually changes their brain. Their physical brain has chemistry that is altered by the experience of holding power. Now this is important to recognize because of course when someone becomes powerful for the first time, we know with scientific evidence that this will adjust their thinking, it will adjust the way their body behaves. And so we need to be prepared for that and we need to think about that when we have someone become powerful. So how does it actually change you? Well, when it comes to your mind, there's a few things that happen. One is that it increases risk-taking dramatically. Now this is bad news for us because we don't want power, powerful people to take unnecessary risks. And yet, when you become powerful, you are by, de by definition one of life's winners. In other words, things have gone very, very well for you, repeatedly over and over in your life, right? If you end up as the president of a country, you are systematically winning in life. Now, the reason that matters is because you start to think that you can't lose. And when you start to think that you can't lose, you start to roll the dice more. And the more you roll the dice, you're gambling with other people's lives because now you are in charge. And your decisions affect other people and not just you. Now, this is tied to a concept known as illusory control. And illusory control is something that is highly correlated with powerful individuals where they begin to develop delusions of grandeur where they think they can change things that they absolutely cannot control. So we absolutely do not want this to happen for people in power, but it does. The second thing is that this actually changes their sort of self-centeredness. It makes them think that the world revolves around them. Now this is also understandable. I mean, imagine if every time you walked into a room, everybody deferred to you. Every joke you told, they laughed at you, or laughed with you rather, I should say. And every time that you said something, they all nodded their heads and, and smiled and said, wow, what an astute comment that was. It goes to your head, right? The experience of being powerful is a very, very unusual experience psychologically that most of us will never, ever understand. And the more that this happens to someone, the more that they start to get full of themselves. And this narcissism, when combined with illusory control, can be a very dangerous combination. So people think they can get away with it in power, and that partially explains why powerful people abuse their authority so often. Now, it also changes your brain. And the way I'm going to explain this, sort of counterintuitively, is through non-human primates, which can te teach us the lessons of how power operates for humans. And it's in two ways. One is with baboons, and the other is with macaque monkeys. So baboons have a very clear hierarchy. It's very easy to tell in a baboon society who is basically at the bottom rung and who's at the top rung of the baboons. And the reason this matters is because you can then look at what's happening to the baboons. And what you find is that there are different levels of stress at different positions in the hierarchy. Now, as you might expect, being at the very bottom of the hierarchy is very bad for the baboon. And they can measure this with a sort of uh, test of aging. There's an actual biological age that all of us have, which is not the same as the calendar age. So somebody's body could age faster or slower than other people's, right? Now, what they found with the baboons is that the very bottom rungs, they age very quickly because their bodies are extremely stressed. Now, as you go up the hierarchy, they age slower. It's less stressful, takes less of a toll on the body. There's one exception. The alpha male baboon, the one at the very top, ages extremely quickly. And the reason for this is because it's an extraordinarily stressful position to be at the top, because everybody is constantly trying to replace you. And all you have to do all day is think about threats to your position and how to stave them off. So what they've, what they've determined basically in the baboon societies is actually the best place to be is in the second most powerful position where you get access to the mates of your choice and the resources that you want, but you don't have to deal with the stress of constantly having a target on your back. Now, 
lest, uh, lest the, we think this is just for non-human primates, the same is true for humans. When you look at aging for CEOs and presidents, we see the exact same dynamics. Now, there hasn't been the same sort of widespread testing because it's a bit invasive to draw blood and test people um, physically, but you can look at aging physically on a human and sort of see what's happening to them during their time in office. And many of you will have seen pictures of US presidents. Barack Obama, for example, goes into office looking very youthful, comes out with gray hair, right? This is repeated, and there have been studies that look at this using machine learning techniques to look at aging, where they have shown that CEOs that are in charge of companies during particularly stressful times, whether it's a bankruptcy, a crisis, a financial uh, collapse, or a pandemic, tend to age faster than those who are in charge of businesses that are growing or doing very well. So power tends to produce stress and stress tends to produce faster aging. So it actually physically changes your body. But it also changes your brain chemistry. And the way we know this is with looking at studies that examine dopamine in, in brains. Now I'm gonna to have to return to non-human primates for a minute with a study about monkeys and cocaine. So when you look at monkeys and you put them into a hierarchy of four, they very quickly form a very, very clear dynamic of who's number one, who's number two, who's number three, and number four in the hierarchy. And obviously the top two have power and the bottom two do not have power. Now, what these researchers did is they developed a system where the monkey would sit in a chair and it would pull one lever if it wanted banana pellets, food, and it would pull another lever if it wanted intravenous cocaine to be injected into it. Now, what would happen is, ideally, you would have the monkey wanting to choose the banana pellet because it wouldn't want to self-medicate effectively, right? What they actually found was that the monkeys that were powerful did not take the cocaine. They took the banana pellets. And the reason was because the power acted like a drug for them. They had the authority, they had the dominance over the other monkeys, and they just simply were more eager to sort of experience the power like a drug and then feed themselves. The monkeys that ended up on the bottom of the hierarchy took the cocaine. And this was extraordinary because when they rejiggered where the monkeys were, they put them in different groups and they ended up in different hierarchies, the exact same dynamics re-establish themselves. In other words, a monkey who was powerful in group A, but became less powerful in group B, went from taking banana pellets in group A to taking cocaine in group B. And what they found when they actually examined the brains of the monkeys was that their dopamine receptors, the physical basis of their brains, was shifting as a result of experiencing power. So power quite literally acts like a drug to humans. And this is something where we need to be aware of this because this combined with the psychological effects of power, you know, illusory control, risk-taking, narcissism, and thinking you can get away with things, all of this manifests in ways that are highly predictable and negative, they're bad for society. So we do know that power corrupts. But there's another realm of power we haven't talked about yet that we need to cover. And that is, what if there are some people who are just absolutely not suited for power no matter what? And there are, and they're called psychopaths. And these people have traits that are often referred to as the dark triad. Now the dark triad has three parts. Part one is psychopathy or being a psychopath. Part two is Machiavellianism, which means the ends justifies the means in your thinking. And you think, as long as I get my goal, I can do anything I want to achieve it. And part three is narcissism, the idea that the world revolves around you. Now, these traits are highly correlated with each other, so people with the dark triad have elevated levels of psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism. And when they combine, they're extremely, extremely destructive in systems of power. And they're particularly destructive for two reasons. One is because those people are obsessed with gaining power. They have an innate thirst for power. And second, they're very, very good at getting it. And the reason they're good at getting it is because the two words that are most associated with psychopathy of all the words that you can imagine to describe them is superficial charm. 
everyone who studies psychopaths, many people I spoke to who are neuroscientists or psychologists or, or work in forensics uh, criminology, they all talk about psychopaths and they say superficial charm, which means they can get people to like them in very short stints of time. And the answer is because they can blend in and appear to be well-intentioned, well-meaning individuals when they need to. And that's tied to a concept known as empathy. So normal people, we have empathy switched on by default. Psychopaths are exactly the opposite. They have empathy switched off by default. And that means that they can only decide to turn it on when they need to. And when they do turn on their empathy, they're pretty good at passing as a normal psychological profile of a person. And that convinces people that they're actually harmless when in fact they're very, very harmful. Now, if you think about the way we design systems of power in the modern age, think about what we do. We have the job interview, we have the election. What are those? Those are the times where superficial charm is going to serve you best, right? Because all you have to do is make someone like you for a short period of time. Now, unfortunately, psychopaths are not curable. It's something that's actually wrong with a part of their brain known as the amygdala. And as a result of this, the solution is not to reform the system with a psychopath in charge, it's to get the psychopath out of power. And so we have different remedies for different problems. For ordinary people, we need to design systems better so that power works effectively by attracting and promoting the right people into positions of leadership. But when it comes to psychopaths and those with the dark triad, it doesn't matter whether power corrupts because they're already corrupt. They're already unsuited for power, and all that we can do is to try to get them out of power as quickly as we possibly can and to block them from obtaining power in the first place. In modern society, very few people are happy with our systems of power. As a political scientist, I have never had someone come up to me and say, your job is obsolete because we already get this right. We've already figured it out how to make power work effectively for everyone. And in fact, a lot of people tend to look up in society to our leaders and think we could do better, to think that we could have better people in charge of us. So the task is to figure out how to reform the workings of power, the, the dynamics around power, so that it, it attracts and promotes the best people in society. How can we do that? Well, the first thing to think about is why is that not happening already? And as we've already seen, that's partly because of what we talked about as self-selection bias. That certain people gravitate towards power like moths to a flame. These are the kinds of people that we describe as power hungry, right? Which we do not want to be in charge of our societies and yet end up there very, very often. And those people are making a cardinal mistake of the way they think about power. They think about power as a goal in itself that power is the ultimate aim of someone who wants to become powerful for the sake of it. What we need in society are people who view power as a tool, a tool to help other people, a mechanism to make other people's lives better rather than something that's just good for the individual who becomes powerful. And too often the exact opposite happens. So how can we figure out how to make this work better? Well, the first thing I would say is we need to design systems of power with the worst possible person in mind and then work backwards. So if we already know that people are drawn to power like moths to a flame when they should not be in power, people who are psychopaths, Machiavellian, thinkers, narcissists, etc., we should design systems that anticipate that that person is going to try to get power. And then we should put in safeguards to ensure that they don't. And then we should try to find ways to weed out those people who already are in power. That's our task to make this work better. Brian 500명이 넘는 권력자들을 만났습니다. 권력이 절대 부패하는 이유와 
권력을 욕망하는 사람들을 알아보게 됐죠. And too often the wrong people are attracted to power. Those are the people we describe as power hungry. 나쁜 권력자는 감시하고 최고의 사람을 권좌에 올리는 방법. 브라이언 클라스에게 들어봅니다. <목소리> 전 세계에 흩어져 있는 위대한 생각들을 모았습니다. 어떤 생각은 우리를 먼 곳으로 데려갑니다. 웰컴 투 EBS. 위대한 수업 Great minds. My name is Brian Kloss. I'm an associate professor in global politics at University College London. And at the same time, we need to attract people to power who don't want it in the first place. There, are, there is a sort of a lot of wisdom to the notion that a lot of the best people who could wield power effectively are those who don't want power in the first place. So how do we solve that problem? Well, there's a few things that I think we should do. The first thing is I think, I think we need to think a lot more about randomness and how we can use the power of randomness to both attract people into power and to punish those or hold them accountable when they abuse their power. Now imagine that you're a cop in the New York City Police Department and you get a phone call and it says, go to this crime scene where we think there's a whole bunch of uh, drugs involved and there's also a lot of money. And we want you to sort of look over this crime scene, keep it safe, don't disturb anything, and then backup will arrive to help you to try to determine what to do next. So you go into this place and you see that there's $20,000 on the table and a whole bunch of drugs that are worth a lot of money. Now, what you don't know is that this is a fake crime scene. And that the fake crime scene has video cameras that are hidden in the walls as well as microphones that are hidden in the ceiling. And what they're doing is they're doing what's called an integrity test to try to see whether the police officer is going to abuse their authority and steal some of the money or take some of the drugs for themselves. And what they'll do is they'll sort of, let's say they take $5,000, they put it in their pocket, and then the backup arrives and they say, look, I found $15,000 in this crime scene, and that's what they report. Now, of course, when that happens, this officer is either fired or arrested. And this is a way to get rid of corrupt police officers. And it works. But the really genius part of this is that it's completely randomly selected, which means that any police officer can be subject to this at any time. Now that magnifies the effect of this because real crime scenes might actually be imagined by the police officers as being fake. And lo and behold, when they studied this, they surveyed all the police officers in the New York City Police Department. And they asked them, how many of you were subject to an integrity test this year? In other words, how many times did you go to a crime scene that turned out to be fake when you believed it was real? And 6,000 times, the police officers said, yes, this happened. But in reality, there were only 500 integrity tests. In other words, there were 12 times as many uh, instances in which a police officer went to a real crime scene and thought it was fake. Now, this had a rippling effect throughout the force because every single time that an NYPD officer went to a crime scene in the future, they thought to themselves, are there cameras? Is somebody watching me? Are there microphones in the ceiling? And as a result, they behaved better. So you got a system-wide reform out of just 500 randomized tests. That is the power of randomized oversight to ensure that people behave well when they're in positions of power. We should do randomized integrity tests for politicians and for police officers and so on. And you don't need to do it repeatedly. You just need to do it once. So maybe it's not for the right reasons. Maybe they're just worried about getting caught, but the end result will be the same. It will clean up the system. So that's the power of random oversight to expose corruption and abuse of power. But randomness has another application that I think is very useful. And that application is tied to the idea of who ends up in power in the first place. It's tied to a concept that political scientists call sortition. So in ancient Athens, 
there was a system to determine who ended up in power that was called sortition. It's effectively like jury duty, but for politics. And what it meant was that each year, a, a, a series of people were randomly selected from the population to govern society. And because it was random, there was no self-selection bias, right? You couldn't have power-hungry people end up in positions of leadership because they didn't get to choose. There was no election, no campaign. Instead, it was just random. Now, in the modern world, I don't think we should do this because politics is so unimaginably complex, right? If you think about something like a nuclear test ban treaty to, to determine what to do with nuclear weapons, that requires some serious expertise. So if we randomly selected people from the population, I think we'd have some serious problems on our hands. However, I do think we should use sortition for oversight. And what I mean by this is that you could establish some sort of shadow parliament or shadow board in business that debates and discusses the same things as the politicians, completely randomly selected from the, from the, uh, from the you know, citizens or from the company, and then ends up providing oversight. In the US, for example, you have the House of Representatives in Congress. It's 435 members of that. You'd randomly select 435 people for a shadow House of Representatives, and they would debate exactly the same things that the real House was debating. Now, there wouldn't be any self-selection bias, there wouldn't be any influence of money because there'd be no lobbying, and there wouldn't be a sort of systematic skew towards power-hungry people. And then what you'd do is you would not give them any real power, but it would provide a parallel system where a journalist could then ask, look, you know, you guys are trying to do this, which seems to be influenced by lobbying. When we take the randomly selected group of people, they're coming up with a totally different answer to this policy challenge based on compromise rather than partisanship, based on trying to problem solve rather than to get rich. And as a result, it would provide a very clear juxtaposition between what someone might do randomly selected from the population and what politicians actually do. And this would provide a check on those who are in power. The same could, of course, happen in business, right? So this approach, I think, could iron out some of the problems tied to the fact that power inevitably attracts certain kinds of people and repels other kinds of people in a non-random way. On top of this, I think we need to think more carefully about how to recruit people into positions of power. Now, I've previously talked about how recruitment can, dif can sort of differentiate who ends up in positions of power when we talked about the New Zealand police recruitment versus American policing. But there's something deeper that we need to think about, which is just about getting more people to apply for jobs that have power behind them. Now, the best example of this, again, comes from the police. And in a small town in Alaska, in the United States, there's a community called Stebbins. And Stebbins had a problem, which was that nobody wanted to become a police officer. So when they recruited, they, would barely, uh, they were barely able to actually get the number of officers they required. And that meant that 100% of people who applied got put in uniform. Now, this manifested itself in a particularly destructive way because all of the police officers in Stebbins at one period were convicted felons. All of them had been convicted of serious crimes. The, police, the, the chief of police in Stebbins had been convicted of 17 crimes, and these were not minor offenses. There were sexual assaults, domestic violence, etc. So when you lived in Stebbins and you called nine, you know, 911 to get the police and you had been you know, beaten up by your boyfriend, for example, all that would happen was another domestic abuser would come to your house. This was disastrous. Now, the way to solve this problem is to make sure that when positions of power are advertised and when you're recruiting for them, think carefully about how you can widen the scope of the pool of applicants to make it as deep as possible. Because the deeper the applicant pool, the more people you can reject and still get great power holders in the future, right? So if Stebbins had a thousand applicants for every place, they would not have selected the criminals to become cops. And this is something that sounds so obvious when you say it, and yet it is not a major focus of our power centers. If you think about 
politics in most of the, the sort of democracies of the world, political parties spend a lot of time and money on campaigns, but they don't spend a lot of time and money on recruiting candidates. They sort of just wait for people to sign up, right? So they sort of roll out a red carpet to the power hungry among us and say, who wants to be in charge? Well, lo and behold, the power hungry people show up. And those people are very often those who do not have all of our best interests at heart. Instead, they have their own best interests at heart. And you are also systematically more likely in that situation. Of narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy um, when they go into power. So we have to think much more carefully about this. And this leads to the next lesson, which is to proactively recruit people into positions of power in order to find those who don't want to be powerful, but would be exceptionally good at wielding authority. Now, this is very, very important because when you think about the problems I talked about previously about systems, this is one of the ways to fix it, right? Even if your system is not perfect, as long as you have a very deep applicant pool and you've recruited proactively, you'll still end up with a good person in power. They don't need to be perfect. They just need to be someone who's good and decent and motivated for the right reasons. So that's why I think businesses and also political parties uh, you know, in democracies and so on, need to think very, very carefully about how much time and effort they go, they put into trying to recruit someone who is effectively drag kicking and screaming into a position of power. And the way that they should do that is they should look for people who have established a track record of good leadership, of servant leadership to their communities or their companies, and then ask them, would you consider going for this role? If we only think about the survivors, the people who seek power in the first place, are good at getting it and are good at holding on to it, come what may, then we are going to misunderstand how power operates. So we need to spend way more time thinking about recruitment. Then on top of this, we need to think about rotation. Now, what I mean by this is that you need to rotate people through positions of power so they don't end up getting too comfortable. This is very, very important because abuse of power tends to happen in places where, where those who work together become, become so comfortable with each other that they trust that nobody will blow the whistle on their bad behavior, right? In other words, they sort of think to themselves, I can get away with this because all these people who I've worked with for 10 years, I can trust them to keep quiet. You'll see that a lot of the worst abuses in the history of policing in Britain have come from units where there has been zero rotation. So you imagine you have sort of a drug busting unit. All the people have worked together for 10 years. They start to develop a little bit of a taste for stealing money from drug dealers when they raid crime scenes and nobody says anything. So how do you solve this problem? It's very simple. You just make sure that every six months a different person joins the team because that person cannot be trusted. They're new and there's a very high risk when someone joins a system of power that if they are upset about the violation of ethical standards or the corruption that's ongoing, they'll say something. And just that risk, that threat is very, very important as a deterrent. So systems of power have a sort of multifaceted feature to them that if we want to fix them, we have to think about all of it. We have to think about the systems that promote people into positions of power and make sure that those weed out the psychopaths, those abusive individuals, and those who want power in the first place for its own sake. And we also have to find a way to get rid of those bad apples who are in power and are clinging on to it. Now, one of the questions that I would ask someone who is trying to apply for a senior job in a company or is trying to become the leader of a country is this, what would it take for you to think that you are no longer necessary in power. In other words, what specific goal do you want to achieve that once you achieve it, you would step down? Now, that sounds like a very straightforward question, and most of us could answer that after a few moments reflection. But the thing is, for someone who is the bad apple that we want to prevent from getting power, the power-hungry individual, the psychopath who thinks about power as a goal and not a tool, that person is going to be completely stumped because the way they've thought about power their entire life is that it is never something you step down from. I've talked a lot about how power is broken and I do not want to leave the impression that power is uniformly a dystopian area where only bad people end up in charge. That's absolutely not the case. There are huge numbers of people who seek to serve their communities and end up as powerful individuals in modern society. But the question is, who should we focus on, right? We've already solved part of the equation because we already have some good people in charge.
But I think we need to engineer better outcomes. We need to engineer better outcomes by changing systems of power, not by simply condemning individuals. Of course condemn them when they behave badly, but if we just stop there, we're going to repeat history. Now, in ancient Rome, there's the story of Cincinnatus, who was a person that was asked to become powerful, to take over for a short period of time. And he did take power on two different occasions. And in both instances, after he achieved his goal, after he managed the crisis, he stepped down. And the sort of saying is that Cincinnatus went back to his farm where he really wanted to be. So for him, power was a burden. And that's how power should be. Power should be uncomfortable. It should be something that we don't necessarily want to relish because the decisions you make when you're in power inevitably hurt people, right? They hopefully help a lot of people, but anyone who's powerful is making decisions that have distributional consequences. There are some winners and some losers. And by creating those losers, you have responsibility. So power done properly is something that weighs on the conscious, consciousness and, and conscience of a powerful individual. It is something that weighs you down and keeps you up at night. If it doesn't, you shouldn't be in power. So the question is, what do we do? The answer is we reform systems, we build on what we've already gotten right, we try to make sure that we empower those who have a track record of doing the right things in power, and then we, from the bottom up, redesign systems to attract, promote, and ensure that the best among us end up in those positions of authority. Now, every so often, Cincinnatus will arise among us, the person who just happens to be in it for the right reasons. I don't think we should put the fate of our societies on a bet that ultimately is about luck. I think instead, we should make our own luck. And that means that we make Cincinnatus. We don't wait for him to come off the farm. To do that, we have to all put our heads together, reform systems, and make power work for all of us.